the other night? Uh, that was uh, the group at um, Grand Grand Yes. Thank you. So this is the the most important piece of legislation for you just to have some understanding of it. It's called the Interpretation Act. Now this Act actually tells you how you read and what should be the structure of an Act. So it sets out that the, um, the preamble of an Act uh, and the regulations, they form part of the Act, but anything that, that is part of a marginal note or a heading has no power in relation to the Act. It's only the content of the sections that can be enforced. All of the rest is there uh, purely for the means of giving you some guidance in what that section is referring to. The section I've put up there is 14.1 uh, and this is one of the most important sections in the whole of the Interpretation Act. Now this, I'm speaking of the Federal Interpretation Act. You also have one here uh, in Ontario. But because the federal law takes precedent over the uh, territorial laws, then this act prevails. So what this is saying in, in brief is where an act is either amended or, or whether it, it is um, removed or whether it's combined with another act, the following is not affected and it goes through uh, A, B, C, D and E and it's E that we are interested in. Uh, so the revocation or the amendment or the combination of an act does not affect uh, anything uh, whatsoever uh, done, completed, uh, established, existing or pending at the time of the repeal or revocation where it's not inconsistent with the Act. So they can delete something that's inconsistent with the Act. But if you have a right that is established in an earlier Act and they amend that Act or combine it or repeal it totally you still have that right. And the important one is your land. If you purchase your land uh, under an act, say 30 years ago, and that act has been repealed all the way through, you still have the rights that you had in the original act when you purchased the land. So this is why I say it is so important to understand these things. So that's 14.1 uh, uh, and it's um, under the section E, section E, 14.1 uh, section E. And this is what I was talking about earlier, your jurisdiction. Uh, so the definition of what the word jurisdiction is, uh, an act has uh, the, the territory or sphere, sphere, the territory or sphere of activity over which the legal authority of a court or other institution applies. So it's the courts, it's the parliament, can be your police, whatever. The jurisdiction is exactly that. So the Act has to actually define very, very clearly what the power is. 
then, uh, and, and where it can be administered. Definitions are also very, very important because there can be some slight variations between one act and another. And the other interesting thing with an act, because it says something in one section, that can't be taken into another section and say, oh yes, but it also uh, includes that because that's in the same act. It can't. The only power is individually in each section. So the, the power is the ability to produce an effect, uh, ability to get uh, extra base hits, I'm not sure whether that comes from, uh, capacity for being uh, acted upon or undergoing an effect. So uh, that's the, the power itself, so the act must clearly identify that. Now we're moving on towards more of what we're here for this afternoon. Uh, and I'm going to link the international law to the Francophone immigration policy and I'll show you where it's all coming from. Right at the outset, can yeah. you talk about why should we obey any kind of international law? Is there any obligation no, none whatsoever. In, in actuality, that's what the heading is saying. International law is direct, in direct conflict uh, with the Canadian Constitution because you are a sovereign nation. You are entitled to determine your own social and, uh, and political future. So yes, you're correct. Uh, international law is created by an entity that is not subject to any ballot box anywhere. International law is not debated or ratified in any nation's parliaments. International law violates the sovereignty, as I said before, of your country. This is the real bad side of it. Not that there is a good side, but this is the worst of the worst. International law is based on Roman Franco law. And you are guilty until you, are prove, you prove your own innocence. And I don't know about Canada, I assume it will be the same. We had an act come through uh, Canberra, the Federal Parliament in Australia, for the judges of our High Court to be able to sit on the World Court. Now there's 76 senators who sit in that chamber and I was the only single one. I was one against 75. And, and my greatest objection to it was that in that bill the bill purported to make international law take precedent over Australian Commonwealth law. And again the argument is, then our Governor General could not give that royal assent. Impossible. So when the vote was taken, and I was the only one who objected, I asked the Chair for that to be recorded, uh, and the, or the President. And the President said, yes, it will be recorded. And I said, Mr President, I would like you to attach something to that. And he said, what is it, Senator? I said, God plus one is a majority. <laughs> they didn't like it. <coughs> so the international law also limits uh, a nation's ability, uh, a sovereign nation by underpinning uh, the right of a country to determine its social and legal standing. 
and it also breaches your Canadian constitution because these laws overarch over other sovereign nations as well. Um, has anyone heard of the Circumpolar uh, Agreement under the United Nations? No. Yeah, it, it exists. Uh, there is another one uh, that used to be called the Draft Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which has the lovely, lovely anachrony of, of DRIP, um, and that now is an, an actual United Nations declaration. So it's the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And I think it's section 24, which actually says in that declaration that the Indigenous people have the right of total restoration of their lands. So that's the whole of Canada. Either monetary payment for it, or, and this is absolutely ridiculous, to be provided with an equal amount of land somewhere else. Obviously that isn't inhabited by another indigenous group. Yeah, have a look at it. DRIP, it's the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. That's the type of international law that is uh, what, what I call uh, harming your rights, your constitution. <clears throat> this, and I make no apologies for this, <laughs> Donna, because it's on your table. This is Mr. Maurice Strong. And in 1992, in the Rio um, convention that they held, he made this statement. It is clear that the current lifestyle and consumption patterns of the middle class involving high meat intake, so lock on that, that's why it's in red, consumption of large amounts of frozen and convenience food, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and workplace air conditioning and suburban housing are not sustainable. He was saying that in 1992. Could you let me put into a perspective? Because prior to that, more strong was one of the um, you know, advocates of uh, extreme measures against the oil shortage. Then there was no oil shortage. Yes. It was all about, you know, we're going into another ice age. Yes. So this, is, this isn't the beginning. No, no. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just picking it for, a, for a, uh, a very, very select purpose. And it is that. Who saw that in your local newspaper? Yeah. Couples of people have? Yeah. World Health Organization. Yeah. So any, any, they're saying, even red meat. If, it's consume, if you consume more than eight ounces of red meat three times a week, you are in the same class or the possibility of sustaining cancer as a person who smokes. Bit of a stretch. Uh, so that came out on the 26th, right? What's that? Five days ago. And I just... When, it, when I saw it, I thought, I've seen that before. Maurice Strong. <coughs> Is this a picture of Maurice Strong intestine? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wouldn't look that good. <laughs> yes, yeah, so this is a, a, a young lady uh, who actually, to her credit, uh, really brought this into uh, some notice uh, worldwide. Yeah, okay, this is the beast. Yes, sir. This may be an inane question, but there's something that crossed my mind when I read that article about uh, the meat products. Is there any chance that there's a tie in with some of the religions of the world? 
that, that, that is a, a possibility. Um, I said this at the meeting the other night. Uh, do you know the definition of a conspiracy? Because this is the, the area that we're getting into that we are accused of. We're not there, I can tell you why. Right? Because the definition of a conspiracy is a hypothesis unsustainable by fact. So you have an idea, be it good or bad, but you can't prove it. That's what a conspiracy is. When somebody says to you, Hickley, oh, you're nothing but a conspirator, right? You say, hang, hang, hang on, hang on a minute. Do you know what you're saying? Like, don't be in their face. Approach them in the manner that, that you're trying to help them. Listen, mate, I, I don't know whether you know you're wrong, um, but I, I'd like to explain to you what you've just said. You've just said, Ickley is a conspiracy. And then give them the definition. And say, so now,